Hey guys, so we're going to be continuing in chapter 1 of Malachi. Now Malachi is once again the last book of the Old Testament, the last book of the prophets. And with this, God is giving the people of Israel and all future generations a, a word of wisdom for how to treat sacred things, for how to honor God and to worship Him. Because after this, there will be 400 years of silence where there will not be another prophetic word from God and there will not be a another book added to the Bible after this book of Malachi. So it begins where we left off in verse 6 of chapter 1. It says this, A son honors his father and a servant his master. But if I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is your fear of me? Says the Lord of armies to you priests who despise my name. Yet you ask, how have we despised your name? By presenting defiled food on my altar. How have we defiled you, you ask, when you say the Lord's table is contemptible? So this is the second question and answer scenario in the book of Malachi, and there are six of them. This second one is they ask the question, how have we defiled you? How have we done wrong? And he says, by the food that you're offering on the altar, by these sacrifices that you're trying to give, you are dishonoring me. So then they might say, well, what are we doing? You know, we're, we're giving you something that's better than nothing, right? And he goes on to explain just how wrong they were with these actions. Now, before we get into the main thrust of what they were doing, I, I want to go back to verse 6 where it says, A son honors his father and a servant his master, but if I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is your fear of me? Says the Lord of armies to you priests who despise my name. So he's saying, where is your fear of me? Where is your reverential awe of who I am? You're coming flippantly, offering these sacrifices. He's speaking specifically to the priests right now, the religious leaders who should know better, who do know better, and they are the ones who are defiling the altar time and again by giving polluted offerings to God, and he is not happy with it. And this is kind of like how uh, people are nowadays. They think they're doing God a favor when they give $5 in the offering plate and they got the $5 because they stole it from their neighbor one way or the other. Or they, they got this money by being a cheat at work and deceiving the person that they were selling something to, whatever it might be. Uh, that That's missing the point on why we give. If we're doing it with a wrong motivation and with um, wrong way of obtaining it, that that's uh, not good either. So whenever it says, how have we de despised your name? He tells the priest, by presenting defiled food on my altar, how have we defiled you, you ask, when you say the Lord's table is contemptible. So they were not caring about the things of God. They were neglecting it for their own benefit. They were giving these polluted sacrifices to God. And the thing is, is most likely the first time they did this, most of the priests were probably feeling very hesitant about it, probably very uh, worried if this was right or wrong. And then the more that they did it, the more okay they became with it until they're just like, okay, grab whatever mangy sacrifice we can get. You know, it doesn't matter. And as a result, they probably became more and more hard-hearted to the sins that they were committing. And so... Whenever they were to give these sacrifices, they were supposed to be giving undefiled animal sacrifices. You know, no broken legs, no eyeballs plucked out. It should have looked right. No spots or, or streaks in it. Um, not old and dilapidated. It should have been a prime physical specimen. Give the best of the flock, the first fruits of your produce. And they did not do that. They went the exact opposite. And if they had 20 uh, sheep, and let's say two of them, you know, had a broken leg and, you know, just all kinds of problems, they would choose those two to give the sacrifice to God instead of the best two. And that's what we oftentimes do. We give God our leftovers and we think he'll be happy with that. God wants the first fruits. Whenever we get a salary, we shouldn't be giving after we, um, well, let me pay to Uncle Sam first and then I'll see what I can give to God. First, you give to God before you pay your rent before anything, God gets the first fruits and we should be giving to God before anything else or anyone else. We should have that in the back of our head of where God's money goes because ultimately it's not ours, it's God's. 
And so what they were doing was, is they were giving these polluted sacrifices, and uh, we might not be giving sacrifices in this way today. I mean, the sacrifice, the sacrificial system has ended, but what do we give to God? We can give Him money, talent, time, energy, all, all the different things that make up our lives. We have that as as well as our own physical bodies. The Bible calls us a living sacrifice that we should be holy and acceptable to God. All of these things should go together to point to Jesus Christ. God already showed us how to do this when we can look back at what he did for us, Jesus, who was the perfect sacrifice that all the animal sacrifices were pointing to, Jesus without any sin, no deformity, no problem, he willingly died in our place. He was the sacrifice that took away the sins of the world that all who would believe on him would be forgiven and have new life in Christ. And that's what uh, God gives us, and that's the picture of what Jesus does on the cross. So it goes on in verse 8, when you present a blind animal for sacrifice, is it not wrong? And when you present a lame or sick animal, is it not wrong? Bring it to your governor. Would he be pleased with you or show you favor? Asked the Lord of armies. And now plead for God's favor. Will he be gracious to us? Since this has come from your hands, will he show any of you favor? Asked the Lord of armies. So he's saying here, if you were to give a gift to the President of the United States or the Queen of England or somebody of very high stature, a, a famous politician, movie star, whatever, somebody that you wanted to give a gift to who you know you valued a lot, who's of high importance, you're going to try and give them a good gift. If you're going to give them a gift, you're going to give them a good gift. You're not going to, if you're going to take the time to give them a gift, you're going to make it, you know, memorable as best you can. Now, some people might not choose to give a gift because they don't like that person or they don't respect this, this guy. So they say, well, I'm just not going to give them anything. Okay. But if you respect somebody and you want to give them a gift, you're going to want them to be pleased with it. Your best friend or your mom or whoever, you want to give a gift that they would appreciate. So how much more so the God of all creation why is it that when we give a gift to our best friend, we want them to really love it and they want, we want them to be pleased with us, but then when we give a gift to God, we're just, yeah, he should just be thankful I gave him anything. He'll be happy with that just because, you know, he'll, he'll accept whatever I want to give him and it doesn't really matter. That shouldn't be our attitude. Our attitude should be, I want to give God my very best. You know, I love the... Um, daily devotional book called My Utmost for His Highest. And I'll read it periodically. I haven't read it in a while now. But uh, but the book itself, just that name, is such a powerful title, My Utmost for His Highest. I want to do my best for Him every day of my life. And that should be our desire. But, but they're kind of going, you know, I think God should be just appreciative of the fact that I am giving Him anything and in fact, I think God's going to really bless me because I decided to give him some leftovers. So in verse 9, the second part, it says, Since this has come from your hands, will he show any of you favor? Asked the Lord of armies. So they're kind of expecting some favor from God, some some blessings, some rewards for, you know, wow, I, I gave God the worst sheep that I could for this sacrifice. He's really going to be uh, really thankful that I decided to do that. No, God, God wants the best. And he won't accept anything but first place in our life. And now oftentimes we would say, oh, well, God is first place. But whenever we look at how we're spending our time, our energy, our money, all of those things, if God's getting the leftovers, then although verbally we would say God's in first, our life might be pointing to a different reality. So what's happening here is they are giving sacrifices that are in violation of the Mosaic law. It says in Deuteronomy 15, but if there is a defect in the animal, if it is lame or blind or has any serious defect, you may not sacrifice it to the Lord your God. It doesn't say, well, it might not be the best idea. It says you must not do this. If it has any of these problems, do not sacrifice it to God. And they completely disregarded that and went ahead and sacrificed there. So verse 10 then says, I wish one of you would shut the temple doors so that you would no longer kindle a useless fire on my altar. 
I am not pleased with you, says the Lord of armies, and I will accept no offering from your hands. So God's just saying, I just wish you would just shut the doors and not offer a single sacrifice than to offer this abomination of these leftovers. You're not giving me anything but what you don't want. So you think I'm going to want what you don't want. It's almost like, you know, for Christmas, somebody gives, there's a gift that they never wanted. They don't, you know, they think it's kind of horrible. Then they give it to somebody and they expect them to just be thrilled with it. And it's like, there might be some rare occasions where you don't like something and you want to give it. But oftentimes it's like, I'm just trying to get rid of this thing. And, you know, if we kind of have received one of those types of gifts, we're like, uh, you know, I don't know why they gave that to me, whatever. But whenever we think about God, this isn't just like, well, I kind of gave him not the best Christmas gift, but we're doing this to God because we have sometimes devalued uh, our estimation of him as the reason why we wouldn't want to give more sometimes. Um, so what this is saying, whenever he's saying just shut the doors, is he's saying re- religious activity that's not rooted in humble adoration to God it slanders his holy character and his good name. And so instead of just going through these empty motions that are just for show and really have no basis in a spiritual transformation, he's saying if that's all you're doing is just wanting to look religious and seem like you're being very pious, just shut the temple doors now because you're not accomplishing anything. And unfortunately, I think there's a lot of churches nowadays that God could say the same thing to. That he could say, you guys are you know, getting big crowds and you're singing these cool songs and stuff, but your actions are showing me that you're not a church that is pointing to Christ. It's more just pointing to yourselves. And that's not what God wants, pointing to how great of religious actions that you're doing instead of the right actions behind them. So verse 11 says, My name will be great among the nations from the rising of the sun to its setting. Incense and pure offerings will be presented in my name in every place because my name will be great among the nations, says the Lord of armies. But you are profaning it when you say the Lord's table is defiled and its product, its food, is contemptible. You also say, look, what a nuisance, and you scorn it says the Lord of armies. You bring stolen, lame, or sick animals. You bring this as an offering. Am I to accept that from your hands? Asked the Lord. So God says, from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name will be great among the nations. And instead of proclaiming the greatness of God, once again, they're they are not doing that. So verse 14 says, The deceiver is cursed who has an acceptable male in his flock and makes a vow but sacrifices a defective animal to the Lord. For I am a great king, says the Lord of armies, and my name will be feared among the nations. So he says so he says the deceiver is cursed, who has an acceptable male, and chooses not to offer the acceptable male, but gives one of these defective animals instead. And so not only are they cursed, but he calls them a deceiver. They're trying to give the outward impression to their friends or maybe even trying to pull a fast one on God that what they're giving is good when really God knows it's not their best and it's not with the right heart behind it. And so this is kind of like the story of Ananias and Sapphira in the book of Acts when they lied about what they were giving God and bringing God less than their best, they were deceivers. And like Ananias and Sapphira, who pretended to surrender everything to God, but really did not. So they they were acting like they gave God everything when they really hadn't. And sometimes that's how, how we act. When Whenever we do not honor the Lord as the great king, as it says in verse 14, as the great king, we fail to worship him properly. And God wants us to worship him properly. He wants us to have a right picture of who he is. And if we just think that he's just this being who should be thankful for the 30 seconds of prayer I give him and the, you know, 2% of my income that I give him, then we're kind of missing the boat. Now, I don't want you to get away from this thinking that what I'm saying is, is to be right with God is to somehow do extra actions. That's not what I'm saying. But what I am saying is that 
because we know God and we love him, if you have a relationship with Christ, you should want to give God your best. You should want to go above and beyond. And we are human and we are sinful and we will oftentimes fail at that. But our heart motivation should be to want to do better in our walk with Christ. Whenever we give God leftovers, at the very least, we are showing a heart that is in rebellion to God. We are disobeying what God said in terms of giving him the first fruits of our lives. So God had this word against the Israelites, and it is still a word for us today that when we give to God, we should give him our very best. So that's what we got for today, and I hope this was a blessing to you. And until next time, see you then.